Well, evening, evening all. Thank you for coming and thank you for coming to our latest You and I Think event. As the name suggests, these events are meant to make you think about property's role in the world, to lift our eyes beyond the walls of the, the property industry that we might consider uh, to be a sort of dinosaur in the world of business, moves at a snail's pace. We want to see our responsibility, David, if it's not too grand, uh, and our duty to provide genuine answers for society. That's how we think upstairs at you and I. We hope this event will help you to think sort of somewhat differently about some of the issues in our industry. So, here's the preamble. Uh, my name's Richard Upton. I'm the deputy CEO of you and I. And sometimes I think about what I do is it's a little bit like farming. Um, as a farmer would, I sort of look at a bit of land uh, and want to put it to some degree of productivity and create some value to it, but in a sustainable way. As a farmer would, you know, I see a bit of land that's not being used, uh, that's wasteful, and I want to bring it to life. And of course, you know, in a, in a way, as a developer, we could just do what's easy. We could spray it with chemicals, rip up the hedges, uh, and maybe plant some quick yielding crop, make a fast buck, exit stage left. But we would think that that was thoughtless, thoughtless development. I don't think it creates value, uh, and we don't think it creates uh, sustainable value for the generations to come. So we would argue that the, the best form of regeneration is organic, ground up, working with uh, the natural habitat, building on what is already there, promoting diversity, importantly, inclusivity and not a monoculture, but in a world that we all live in of uh, planning guidelines, of economic pressures, and the overarching need, particularly for our increasingly populated cities, uh, to remain as productive as possible, that sort of bucolic, idyllic scenario faces some very real challenges. But we, we need to do the best we can with the materials, the resources we have to, uh, to create something better. So for, for you and I, meanwhile use is actually an essential part of the development processes that helps us to become, in effect, the sort of best farmers that we can be. It helps us to learn the fine grain of a place, the sort of DNA, the, the character, its identity. And if we just hoarded it and kept people out and just wait for that fat planning permission exit stage left, then maybe we would miss something. Maybe we would miss some meaningful conversations, building trust. Maybe we would miss a lot about what we could do for businesses, charities, artists, on enterprises, makers that can grow things there, can test things. I think this is quite important. When you're doing something shorter term, you can take more risks. Now, we are not afraid of failure. Now, we're not used to it either, you and I, but we're not afraid of failure. We can take more risks with something meanwhile, and that's important. But for us, the uh, meanwhile use, which we're talking about tonight, is about an incubator for the future, not just window dressing. We find that patronising, uh, meanwhile, as marketing. Now, this is Preston Barracks down in, in Brighton. It's a fantastic thing that you should visit. For us, meanwhile is about building with a view to lasting benefit, lasting benefit, long-lasting benefit, rather than a a sort of transient intervention, doing things straight away. We're impatient upstairs, immediately for enterprise, for inspiration, to build that trust, community cohesion. For us, it's just plain common sense. It's good husbandry, and actually, in simple business terms, it's good risk management. Now, we want to move the debate, the debate this evening beyond, uh, meanwhile, to worthwhile, and we're struggling with that upstairs some of us, the sort of meanwhile is sort of straight away. The worthwhile is something that has some lasting value. How can we deliver long-term social value based upon an understanding of the land and the surrounding area that allows us to use that land more productively? So as a farmer who understands the soil, whether it's going to be better for potatoes or tomatoes, is it civic, is it residential, is it, is it a bar, is it public realm, Where's the wind come from? What's the seasonality look like? All of those things. Developers need to take a much more careful and thoughtful approach to the places we transform and the communities we work within. This one's Manchester in Mayfield that we've just started. 
So our regeneration over in, in Deptford uh, was based around the railway station, um, just at the far end of that picture. And what we inherited was a place where you could buy non-prescription drugs and a dodgy MOT. Uh, so we, that might have made us a bit more money, but the, uh, we decided to embrace the heritage of this place. That's the, believe it or not, on the left, that's the oldest uh, railway structure in London, 1834. So we thought, well, obviously heritage and, and, and railways. So we bought an old train carriage from, for six grand from Shoebury Ness a firing range, bought it in on Valentine's night, it was freezing cold, 2008. Uh, and then we turned it into this community cafe, which is all very worthy, but it started to bring people together. We brought some enterprises into the arches, uh, a pop-up cinema. It was really, really successful. And here's the scheme just finished. Uh, well, I'm not saying it's finished, it's actually probably just started in a way. Um, it's, uh, there's the arches reconfigured. We gave each of the arches to a, a, a business that is a local business that they all live within 0.2 of a mile. It's complicated. We've planted some seeds in the meanwhile, and they're now going to be permanent forever. And there'll be a, a, a market, a street market opening there. Finally, you'll remember this one, Eric, uh, in, in the summer. The old vinyl factory in Hayes, another example. It's a great history and provenance, the site of the old EMI factory, uh, which some of you know. Now, at the heart of that was a central research laboratory where the music engineers that used to design and come up with inventions for music were allowed in their own pop-up to sort of make other stuff as long as it had commercial advantage. And so they had these porter cabins. It was just a bit of R&D with a bit of, you know, as, as long as they had a bit of time and a bit of money and came back with something with commercial advantage, then that was okay. And do you know what they invented? A stereo sound which is a good thing, obviously, related to music, airborne radar, and then they invented the music engineers with brown sort of coats. They invented the CAT scanner. So, you know, just a bit of risk, a bit of time, a bit of immediacy. And so we used that inspiration. And jobs are clearly needed over in Hayes, like everywhere, particularly in manufacturing. We used that inspiration for in innovation, that heritage, to create our own sort of pop-up. And so we built a central research laboratory. We were offered some grant, but there was a lot of paperwork with that. So we built our own pop-up, a central research laboratory. It's an incubator for innovators. And uh, we've been through a few years now, not just one round of jobs, but time and time again, entrepreneurs are learning things there, the serendipity of their own intellects coming together, and great things are happening. Just the right type of jobs for the area. And in time, that's permanent now. That will be there putting roots down, growing businesses, permanent part of the community that started with the meanwhile. And just moving on to a few other examples, uh, top left and bottom left platform built this, uh, this facility. It was derelict building for years. We opened it up to the, uh, the Young Vic, some artists and some other community groups, a great facility in Southwark. Uh, top right and um, bottom right is uh, the workshop in Lambeth, partnership with the London Fire Brigade where we've got enterprises, charities, two museums. We just opened the Museum of Migration. It's all about inclusivity and migration. It's fascinating. You really should go. And the Fire Brigade want a museum as part of our wider regeneration project, but they don't know what sort of museum they want. So we built a pop-up fire museum in eight weeks. And you know, all that learning, all those conversations are key. We believe and invest in that, what we call now, internally at least, worthwhile to build trust, to drive lasting social value, and to develop plans that are local, that are of place. Summary, cities constantly evolve. We, we don't deliver projects upstairs as a property developer. We help towns and cities evolve. Uh, that's our job, and there's no better way to do that than, than ground up organically. Uh, now, granted, that doesn't create fees for architects, engineers, and estate agents, uh, but we don't apologize for that. But boy, does it build a narrative. It, feel, it builds a really, really great story. And incredible things happen from small, transient activity with lots of energy. Better places are created as a consequence, and none of that is easy. I mean, it's a lot of hard work for the team, and I apologise to everyone in the team that's involved in Worthwhile and Meanwhile. It's a lot of hard work, but it's worthwhile. It makes that land more productive. More productive land benefits all of us, everyone. It becomes worth something, not just to owners and developers 
and investors, but those who work there, the community that live there, the children that play and learn there, and building lasting benefit. And that is, that is worthwhile. That is very, very worthwhile. Here's the cheesy segue, just as I hope the session will be this evening. Thank you. David. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, so I'm David Barry. Um, so um, we're going to have 25 minutes of chat here and then questions from you um, in the audience. Um, anyone can ask anything they want. They're not going to be slung out. I'm not going to be David Dumbleby for the night. Um, what I would say before we start, though, is that in your um, kind of goodie bags, there's no real goodies. Um, <laughs> there's paper. There's no, um, there's no um, uh, Johnny Walker from the minibar, and there's no uh, shampoo sachets. However, um, there is a card, and we would like you very much, um, as with talking, obviously to pay vast amounts of attention to our steam panel, but also at the same time, have a think about answering one question which we'd like you to jot a thought down on the card and then post it in a letterbox or a box which is going to be completely blinding and bleedingly obvious as you leave. Um, it depends how much you've had to drink, but if, uh, it should be obvious to you. And the question we want you to ask or the thing we want you to share is one idea to make meanwhile worthwhile. One idea to make meanwhile worthwhile. So we're sort of issuing a mini fatwa on Israeli raps um, on the 25th version of a kind of art installation. Um, or we're looking to you to come with thoughts which you feel are strong um, for making meanwhile worthwhile. So one idea on the card, in the box, on your way out, much appreciated. And we will share that back with you, I'm sure. So we have a very esteemed panel. We only have a certain amount of time, which is quite short. So we're gonna try and keep it sharp and keep it, um, keep it clean. Um, and make sure that in 25 minutes or so that you, have a, you can say your piece or ask a question. I'm gonna be really hideous, which is that I've completely changed the agenda. Um, which is always helpful. As a former television producer, I can do that. Um, and all I want to do is really just kick off. Right? I don't, if you want to Google people on the panel, please do. They're all very established, esteemed, have all had a great experience and interface with um, Meanwhile in a very important way. Um, but rather than people sharing their swimming medals and rather than people telling us how marvellous they are, which we all know you're marvellous, um, it's just to share with us all um, an inspirational meanwhile use which you may have either been involved with or you attended and it filled your heart and you thought this is absolutely fantastic and this is what it's all about. So be brief and share with us the inspirational moment. It may be nothing to do with the meanwhile. Use. Maybe it mean that you actually took someone there and you fell wildly in love and you ended up being married. We can accept that. <laughs> However, what was the most inspirational thing which you would call meanwhile which you have experienced? Roger. Unlucky me, going yeah. first. <laughs> um, just before that, I've got to just sort of like say, I mean, it's a, there's a lot of bullshit about the word sort of meanwhile, really. You know, I'm not really a great fan of the word meanwhile. Oh. I'm, more, I'm more really in the, the placemaking business. I mean, there's a lot of sort of vanity meanwhile projects out there and you know and there's a lot of words bounded around like local like community and a bit of this the the reality is is as a property developer and we've got some great property developers here we've got you know argent here we've definitely got you and i here it's it's good business and the reason why it's good business is buildings alone are not going to sell major new areas. All the architects out there love to believe that. They love to believe that me as an architect, I'm going to change the world and, you know, my building has changed everything. The reality is it's not. People want to live in places that they love, that they like. And the role of meanwhile, the role of placemaking is to create that demand beyond just buildings, to really think about why people live in communities. 
back to the original question, yeah, the, exam the, the answer is a weird one. I'm going to take Cinema Paradiso yeah. as a film, not a reality. But that's, that's an example of taking over a beautiful piazza and making it community. And I've always been inspired by markets. My parents used to own Greenwich Market. You're going to hear a lot from Eric. I, I started one of my businesses at Camden Market. And I love markets. I love Cinema Paradiso and the way it changed a market square in terms of a community. So, great. So, a, a kind of open space, Italian hilltop village. It's sunny. We're all drinking. We're all singing. We're all sharing. We're all crying. We're all in love. Yeah. That's nice. All right. Yeah, it's great. community. Great. Eric. Is Richard still here? Nope. Richard's down there. Right. Uh, Richard's speech. Um, we all now must vote for Richard. <laughs> There's absolutely no point in the rest of us saying anything because Richard has nailed all the important things. Clearly, the only way to make meanwhile worthwhile is for the people involved to feel it was successful, which requires a balance of risk between those people who own or manage or in some way control the land and those who are going to do something. So we should be asking a series of questions. Who is it for? Is it for the developer to get some brownies? Richard will never admit that he's emptied any of his pockets to get some brownies, but he has. Is it for SMEs, really? Because we tend to kick them out too early. We tend to get them going too fast. We tend to ask them to deliver too many outputs. Is it for the public, for fun? All those things are valid if we do them. It's very difficult to do them, though, particularly in a crowded city. It's quite easy in a field. As Richard said, you plant different things. So I'm going to tell you a quick tale of two cities, literally cities, the city. The corporation sold Spitalfields a long time ago, and they left it empty, but the developer couldn't afford to leave it empty. They were going bust. So we put a meanwhile use in a whole series of them. And that, I believe, really is a worthwhile one because many of those businesses continued and grew. Market Sports, for example, continued and became a big fitness company, publicly um, quoted and so on. So that, I think, was worthwhile. A non-worthwhile little bit of it, we built an opera house. How many people would build an opera house in a market? <coughs> we did it. And the wicked developer came along and said, you must demolish it because it will be too popular. One of our little problems. So the other half of these two cities is Smithfield. Smithfield has been kept empty because people thought something bigger, something better, something more profitable will come along. And the, the intention, as you know, the corporation's intention was to engage with a large developer and then demolish terrible idea. Fortunately, we defeated that. And now the wonderful Museum of London is going to go in. So again, I think although that wasn't interim, the emptiness was criminal, really. My last little point, very quickly. I want to know your inspirational moments. I'm going it's to give moments it to you. of love I'm or... going to... No, to hell with love. Oh, to <laughs> hell with love. But your to... wife's in the audience somewhere. I know, I love her. <laughs> Well, I, I tell her I do anyway. Okay, carry on. But I want to know, know what, what's warmed your heart, Eric. What's been the thing which has really... Oh, Richard Upton. The meanwhile use which has really fired Richard you up. I just want to tell you one little tiny thing. The scale of the opportunity. Within the 0207, very important telephone number, within that area there are over 100 acres of empty buildings. And I don't mean little ones, I mean big buildings. If you simply were to take that... 100 acres, divided up into 500 square foot spaces, divide that again so you've got half of it for circulation, 130,000 live work spaces could be created. Will we ever do that? No. Because unfortunately the people who control, which include the police, the British Rail, well whatever they're called now, and all the rest of them, fear real genuine bottom-up stuff. A moment. Right. A moment. Is there not a moment? Okay, no. fine. Catherine, a moment. <laughs> well, well I still bash away at this romanticism. I, I know it's very, uh, uh, very unfashionable. 
Yeah, well, I am going to give three moments. Everyone else has been breaking the rules, so I'm going to no. answer the question, but I'm going to give three answers. Right. Um, <laughs> I think the fa that my most enjoyable day out ever at uh, Meanwhile project was definitely going to the Barking Bathhouse during the Olympics, okay. which was put up by um, Create London, and was a spa in a car park in Barking. And that meant I went to Barking for the first time ever, and I had a sauna in a box made out of... Um, plywood and then I had a sat on an ice cube in an industrial freezer <laughs> and then I lay on a sun lounger in a on a piece of tarmac with my sisters and had a cocktail okay and um it was it's just full on it's good it was a it was a it was a spa day but in a in the in a barking car park and it was just <laughs> a, it was just a brilliant afternoon out and uh, that was probably my most fun moment in a meanwhile space I think my the thing that I felt most excited by so that was my just happiest and most enjoyable the thing I felt most excited by was browsing through the empty spaces that um, Poplar Harker advertise on their open Poplar platform. I don't know if anyone's come across it, but they've done a sort of audit of their empty spaces, which is everything from pram stores to um, flower beds to um, swathes of garages and just put made, made a um, website where you can browse them and you can pitch you can pitch, you can bid for them, and you can you can bid for them in money, and you can bid for them with sweat equity. And um, if I wasn't so busy running dot dot dot, <laughs> um, then I would probably be thinking about what I could put in a pram store under a building <laughs> in um, Poplar, uh, because it's just I think seeing that catalogue of um, spaces where you could put projects is really exciting. And I'm sure what I've heard from them, that the ideas that they've had coming through are things that they would never have come up with and they would never have done in their own right. So for example, a shop which was impossible to rent, just didn't work as a shop, was became a kicking off point for a kind of interactive game that encouraged people to explore Poplar and get to know it better. Um, some people have put in, are putting in studios in a basement which was Hopelessly, you know, hopeless for what it was designed for. So I think just as a kind of like feeling excited about what you could do with this yeah. broom store and this right. staircase. Um, and then finally, I think the thing that has warmed my heart the most um, has been, uh, you know, and I'm going to talk about what we do at dot 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 is just seeing what a difference having um, affordable space to live in in buildings would otherwise be empty makes for the people that we house. What we do is we let people um, live cheaply in buildings that would otherwise be empty, and we support them to volunteer. And just hearing again and again from people what a massive difference it makes to their their opportunities, their well-being, the things that they can do with their time, mm -hmm. having places to live for a third of what they'd be paying in the market. Um, you know, whether it's finding the time and energy to answer the phones at Samaritans, whether it's being able to take a step back and do a PhD, whether it's being able to move in with their partner when they were living in a house share yeah. before. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a very immediate, I have, I'm lucky enough to have an immediate experience of how much difference it makes to people and it <coughs> gets me out of bed in the morning. So. Okay. Um, Dan. And keep it brief. <laughs> okay, I'll keep it brief. So, and so I really want to just know the greatest moment. So the way I got into Meanwhile um, events and projects was very unorthodox. It was through logistics, of all things. Part of my job description, incredibly boring, I was forced to kind of go out and organise a logistics group for a big opportunity area in Southwark. And so there I am with all the builders and uh, talking about crane movements and lorry movements. And, and the, one, the, the unintended consequ consequence of the meeting was getting builders to build things for free. So every year in Bankside, we have something called the Merge Festival, which is kind of an immerse, immersive arts festival. Um, it takes place for a month, and we take over disused buildings and disused sites. And so my kind of most romantic and powerful um, sort of moment has been some of these projects. It's seeing local residents who would never ever, maybe never have ever set foot in the Tate Modern, even though it's like two blocks away or never been to any of the millions of art galleries we've got in Southwark, sort of accidentally loving art. So that might be Alex Chinek's Upside Down House, where you're walking along the street and suddenly you come across this house that's upside down on a building site, right. or the Melting House. So we got a contractor to give us 9,000 wax bricks and we melted the house to the ground over, over a month and every day you walk past it was in a different state. Or the House of Pain, where you went into an old dentist surgery, <laughs> you screamed as loud as you could, with a random member of the public next to you <laughs> screaming. 
and then that I like light that up. One. That's great. Uh, uh, however, the, the louder you scream, the more the building lit up from the outside. So just being in, a, in, a, in an old dentist surgery with a random member of the public screaming right. and then both giggling right. is my most, uh, my, my, my loveliest meanwhile moment. Right. So we've got S and M. <laughs> we've got a kind of ice house, another version of S and M, I guess. We've got um, kind of a, a beautiful kind of moment which is very special and very different and rather rare. But 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 just do you want to catch it? Um, we've got. Um, a thought about the polemic of space and maybe space which is used productively and usefully and space which is redundant and space which is abused by default by not really being taken up as an opportunity. Um, Reza. Okay, so um, cast my mind back to when I was about 18 years old, traveling around Europe, um, going to different music festivals and going to these you know, amazing, deserted, derelict venues. So one of them was a, um, an old fortress in Serbia, quite a remote part of Serbia. And for five days, this place transforms into this hive of activity with tens of thousands of people, amazing music, amazing art, amazing atmosphere, people from all over the world. And you're like, it's wow, great. you know, like... It's just amazing to see how a completely disused space in the middle of fucking nowhere can suddenly transform into this up. hive of activity where people are just experiencing life to the full. I think that's probably where my inspiration came from. Brilliant. Great. Anna? I think my most inspiring moment out of all the different temporary projects we've done. And don't be, a f don't be a worried, you, you'll offend no one by excluding them. <laughs> is diving into our temporary natural pond, partly because it was such a pain in the arse to deliver. <laughs> I think it nearly broke me and it nearly broke my team. <laughs> so when we got in, we were like, yes. Um, and also because I think it contained one of the key elements of successful meanwhile projects and that it made me think about the city differently it made me think about urban landscape versus natural landscape it made me think about temporary versus permanent it made me think about different social networks um, meeting people in the pond who were dressed in a different way from how I normally saw them on the site was pretty interesting sometimes. <laughs> um, and it just, um, yeah, it was a moment in time which made me reflect in a different way and that was just a m pure joy um, encapsulated in that dive. That's it. Brilliant, okay. So we've got a, had a diversity, thank you, we've had a diversity of, of view um, everything from the sort of millennial, um, the kind of eruption of um, popular culture and excitement, which erupts and then subsides. We've got um, the thrill of um, the thrill of uh, bending construction companies' arms to do one's will. <laughs> we've had a, a, a cold dip, and we've had another cold kind of experience. So. Um, the question I've got then secondarily then is, um, obviously you've all talked about stuff, sometimes it's been subjective, sometimes it's been political, sometimes it's been the kind of doing, sometimes it's been just the euphoria. Um, so um, this all feels rather like entertainment. So it's like these spaces are available for entertainment and that we're making our cities in effect through we're making some part of our city in these gap spaces through entertainment. I love entertainment. I drink it up. I've got more subscriptions to more TV, cable, channel delivery services than you can ever imagine. So, but I should be thinking, I assume, of the city as a place for these sorts of experiences. The question is, worthwhile. When we say worthwhile around meanwhile, is that kind of boo, hiss, the kind of righteous lot have turned up? Or are there ways in which, you know, should we, or sh sorry, it's a windy question, or should, are there ways in which you feel that we could make, meanwhile, worthwhile? 
is it a fantasy which is too right on of me to think that we might have reading classes or we might have ways in which people can care for one another, that we might have medical services delivered in these places, that we might actually give it to the sort of homeless or to the dispossessed, um, or should I basically kind of go and sort of go off and sort of sign up to the various charities which I should go and join and do all that kind of thing. Um, so a question really, what's, can, we t can we do something worthwhile or is all this actually what you're talking about? worthwhile, it's just not socially meaningful and righteous. Dan? So it's a challenging question. I think um, for us, one of the, one of the best ways of, of making meanwhile worthwhile is for it to kind of have a legacy. So I think one of our favourite examples of, of meanwhile being worthwhile is an organisation called Hotel Elephant. So they're, they're a social enterprise, they've been based at the Elephant Castle forever. So they've stuck with the council through thick and thin, yeah. um, through all the different uh, stages of the project, and they've moved around. So they they kind of create uh, artist workspace, and they do, um, you know, they basically provide artist workspace and events and galleries and all that sort of thing. And they've moved around housing estates, disused buildings, all sorts over the last ten years, and we've managed to find them a permanent home. So them getting a 25-year lease on five railway arches is them now having a permanent stake in an area. Uh, where they can, and it's on affordable terms, and they can then deliver these worthwhile, um, cheap, um, for, you know, affordable workspace for local, it's tied to local entrepreneurs and, and students from both universities, and they, and they can deliver that. So they've now got a permanent home and a legacy. So I think that's going from, you know, meaningful, like having a nice organisation doing something for a couple of years, to them being and having a stake in the area for, for long term. Okay, so, um, so, that's, so it can be worthwhile as an incubator function. Yes. Right. Catherine, I think you've said to me, dare I say, um, we, in a previous conversation, <laughs> in a previous life, that actually that social stuff ought to be done, you know, these are incidental yep. spaces, yep. and that actually social stuff shouldn't be done, useful, meaningful stuff shouldn't be done in incidental spaces, they should be part of the structure of service delivery of life. Absolutely. And so these incidental yep. spaces are good for incidental stuff, but actually don't look to them for any scratchy, beardy, meaningful kind of earnest stuff. I don't think that's quite what I said. Okay. Um, but I, that, the gist is right. So I think that um, these pockets of pockets of space, that, you know, they are, they are offcuts. They're places that are in limbo. They're places that are waiting for their permanent use. They're buildings that have had a previous use and are now a bit purposeless. That's why they're available for meanwhile space. If they were really prime and you could have them permanently, they wouldn't be, it wouldn't be available to meanwhile users. Um, and lots of services need that, need somewhere permanent, they need somewhere purposefully designed. You know, if you are vulnerable, if you, if you come out of care, if you come out of the armed forces and you've got um, PTSD, yeah. you need somewhere that you know that you can live in, in the long term where you can get hooked up with your GPs and your local services. You know, what the last thing you need is to be living in a place where you might have to move on. Similarly, if you're running a... Um, you know, running medical services, people need to know where they're going to be able to find you next time they need you. You need somewhere that's designed for it. Um, I think that in our current uh, environment, where actually lots of vulnerable people don't have the services that they need and lots of services aren't being provided um, through the, the systems that you'd expect to be providing them, then it's great if we can harness some of the spare, the spare space um, to provide those services, provide that housing, provide those venues for those community groups. But actually, I think in a rich, in a rich society, we should be the best housing should go to the most vulnerable, the most permanent, most accessible buildings should go to the medical services, and actually the stuff that's left over can be for the, for the fun, the games. Okay. Um, but I also think that a lot of what's happening in meanwhile context is actually extremely worthwhile already. I think that the um, the things that we hear about, the things we see, you know, the King's Cross, the King's Cross Pond, the Barking Bathhouse, these kinds of things, we hear about them precisely because they're fun and eye-catching. You know, we don't necessarily hear about um, the places that are being used to incubate new social enterprises, okay. you know, the, the housing, the you know. So I think it's eye-catching stuff that we hear about and the other stuff maybe goes under the radar. Um, Roger, nonsense? Am I talking nonsense? That we, are we talking quite, nonsense quite that it should nonsense. be worthwhile? I mean, because basically, you know, you might argue, I guess, that, that having a shop selling moleskin notebooks or Louboutin shoes or whatever is worthwhile. 
in a meanwhile state? At the, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not standing here for, you know, to be, be the next leader of the government and pretend that everything that I do is about socially conscious and <laughs> we've got to be really careful about using the terms. They're all great in the council offices, but we've got to really ask ourselves why we're really doing it. And if you live in Croydon and you've had David Bowie describe your community as the worst thing I could say about anything, is anybody, is they're so fucking Croydon. You know, the last thing they're thinking about is some socially conscious development. They actually want people to start believing in their community. They actually want people to start going, do you know what, Croydon's not so bad. You know, we're, here we are, the largest London borough. We've got 500,000 people and somehow we're labelled as the greatest borough. Well, I like to believe in the, in the case of Croydon and maybe our small part in it, that, you know, they've proved that wrong. So being meanwhile and socially conscious just for the sake of saying that, it's, <laughs> it goes down great in council offices and they might be giving you the land, but that isn't the first and foremost reason that you do something. You, you mentioned about entertainment. I've always been a great believer. I, was, I spent 20 years in retail. Retail is entertainment and I had somebody once say something to me about 15 years ago and it really stuck in my mind and it's always stuck in my mind and it is that our responsibility is to create special places and if you're not special anymore if you don't really mean something to anybody you don't exist and I guess all we are we're in the business of trying to make places a little bit more special that's all we are we're not I'm not sitting here and going oh, I'm, I'm I'm Mr. Socially Conscious. You know, it is good business just to do local business. It's good business. That's, that's your customers. You don't need to say it. That's just good business. You want your local community to turn up all the time. It's just good business. And us as meanwhile specialists, you know, we're in business. We've got to make sure that it works out for the developer who's given us the space and us. It's worked out for us financially. But in the end, it's about creating special places. Eric, do you agree? Yeah, it's more and more difficult to be special because there's such a large element of photocopy me too. But you what could... What do you mean? I, I mean, literally, people used to come to me and say, we'd like a Camden Lock, will you do it? And I say, no, because it's a special different place. And if we try and do that in Sheffield at the Canal Basin, it is still a Canal Basin, but it's different. Um, I'm keen on people being specific and about places if they can. But to answer your question about worthwhile, I think as long as it works, I agree with Roger, as long as it works, it's worthwhile. Something is better than nothing in many of these places. A very quick example of that is Battersea. Battersea was uh, left out empty uh, because it, it, it almost never worked and all the rest of that sort of stuff. And they were, I measured it. There was over a mile of hoardings, which blighted the life of a lot of people. They had to walk past it for a long time and we were asked maybe five times to put interim in there and every time the bar was too high. Every time it was too short, too expensive, too difficult. Very silly. So it would have been worthwhile and could now still be worthwhile if they get on with it. Um, just to move on slightly, is um, I just wanted to move on to the challenge really, the challenge for developers and landowners. Anna. I mean, you've obviously done amazing things at King's Cross. Um, for people in the audience who may have a thought, they may be involved either as landowners or as developers or in the development business, um, would there be one or two things that you'd say to them that, that if you're going to be hosting a meanwhile, you really need to be thinking about as a challenge? What are the challenges which we ought to be aware of? Um, I mean, I think. I mean, can I ask one challenge, which is basically is you host all these people, and then there comes a day the bell tolls, you've <laughs> got to boot them out. And the question is, is that obviously, presumably, there's a massive issue, which is basically you've created such a lovely, fabulous, amazing, fabulous, and I'll say fabulous a third time experience, is that um, that no, the people's will heart will break if you have to move them. Or presumably, that's hideous for a developer or a landowner to have to deal with. Well, it is rather, yes. And have you had that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what have you done? Just said, hop it. Um, uh, yeah, Obviously, it's not that crude, but presumably... I think it's a big challenge. You do something and it is meaningful, it is worthwhile. You build relationships with um, all different um, 
groups in, in the local community, then you say, well, actually, uh, we're going to build luxury flats here. It doesn't always go down that well. Um, so, <laughs> yes, it, is, it can be quite challenging. I think... Um, what would be the advice which you'd give one or two people in the development business in the room about? I, I think you have to always be clear about your intentions from the start. Okay. You absolutely have to be honest and transparent about it. I think you, where possible, you need to look at ways of how you can create legacy from those projects. So some of the projects that we've done, we've moved them to sites elsewhere, uh, and they've, they've developed a new life of their own. Right. Um, and I think um, you, you shouldn't let it stop you, because as Eric's alluded to, it, it, when people do say, oh, we can't do that because you know, we're never going to get rid of it, it's going to be, you, you actually have to be brave, take the risk, and when, when things do erupt in your face, you have to you have to go out there and talk to people and explain um, you know why you're doing it and what's happening, um, and try and work to create some kind of legacy moving forward. But it's not always easy. Reza, any tips for operators or landowners or developers in hosting? Because you've obviously done Pop Brixton, which has been immensely what well, appears to be immensely successful. I've got no notion as to whether it's financially broken even or whether it's a, a, mil, a financial millstone I don't know um, but is there a, something which we ought to be aware of or think about if we're hosting these sorts of activities yeah I think the should we know, think about the money side by the way or not I mean it, it depends what your kind of longer term game is right um, but I think that you know, nowadays, if you look at where retail is moving, like people don't want big chains, right? People want local independent businesses. So I genuinely believe that if you create a really exciting hub in a meanwhile use of local independent businesses, like you can then incorporate those into a future development. And actually, like by doing that, you can create a really exciting and vibrant ground floor, which is only going to increase the value of what you have upstairs. Um, you know, particularly if you want to target, I hate to say the word, a millennial customer, um, you know, who is really looking for an interesting, unique experience wherever they go. You know, you don't want to have a, a kind of a Nando's on your ground floor, right? You want to have something which is much more kind of, you know, independent and much more vibrant. So I really think that there's scope to kind of incorporate meanwhile uses, um, you know, in developments in the long term. And, you know, you look at, all areas that get gentrified, the people that go there first are the creative, cool people. And if you look at a meanwhile space, you know, meanwhile space, that that's the kind of person that you're attracting. So I think you can be smart about it and create a win-win scenario, right? For not only the the meanwhile um, tenants and give them a sort of longer-term um, option, but also ultimately the sort of value of the longer-term development. So is the tip that you want to um, encourage and look and, and and bring to the site businesses which are going to grow. In other words, not what what's the word zombie businesses is the tip that when you when you cast so to speak tenants or whatever is that you're looking for businesses which will grow, and that basically people in the room who are in the development business who are thinking about doing it is that if they do it they ought to think about that. Yeah, so, so for example, uh, if we look at Pop Brixton, out of the 45 businesses that we've, we have, you know, 20% have already gone on and found permanent spaces elsewhere. Um, and so for us, that's, you know, it's encouraging. And if you, if you think about your own development, right, these businesses have potential to grow into more permanent spaces. You know, and as they become more successful, they can start to afford kind of viable market rents. Right. So now, um, that's fantastic, thank you. Um, questions from you, from the floor. Um, we'd like some questions. Do people have any questions? You don't have to be polite, but then equally you don't have to be abusive. You can, but I really would like you to put, put we've got a great group here, put them on the spot. Um, I'm a property investor. A property investor, thank you. Thank you. The, the, the panel have talked a lot about social enterprise, um, entertainment. Nobody's mentioned the word sport and exercise. And it seems to me that um, grassroots sport and exercise is something that which most communities desperately need. Is sport and exercise not getting on the agenda of developers for, meanwhile, 
when it could be very worthwhile. Dan. Okay, so one of my favourite ever... And we did talk about swimming, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we did. Which pond. A lake. Well, that's sport. So one of my favourite ever meanwhile projects um, is something called the Marlborough Sports Garden. So for those of you who know Southwark on Union Street, um, yep. as you're going along next, near the junction of Borough High Street, we've got this massive area of tarmac. Um, and it's actually an open space in our plan. So it should be, you know, you're theoretically green or active, but it just looks like a school playground. But it's not. It's actually it's supposed to be kind of, you know, an open space. So the local community came up with the idea of a demonstration project for the Olympics. Yep. They called it the Pop-Up Olympics. So they basically, so going back to the builders, we got the guys from Cellar to give us 60 tonnes of beach volleyball grade sand. So we created a massive beach volleyball court, running track, boxing ring. Um, we basically made a Pop-Up Olympics. We, we probably could have got sued by the Olympics for using the word Olympics, but we went with it anyway. And, and that was a demonstration project to say, hey guys, do, you know, do the local community want to see this place transformed? If so, how? We had 10,000 kids come down the summer, use the space, running around. Sadly, Southwark's one of the most, you know, top of the league for obese, obese children. And now, after this, where are we now? 2017, five years later, we've got a budget of around 800,000 that we've cobbled together to kind of turn it into a permanent sports legacy for local schools. And we need another 1.2 million to finish it off, by the way. But so that is kind of a meanwhile project that's in transition at the moment. Next step is to you know, do the beach volleyball properly. Not many councils want beach volleyball because they're worried about foxes pooing in the sand. But we're finding, finding a way of doing it. Right. And it's a sports project. Um, Reza, you did football in Pop, Pop Brixton Phase 2. Didn't you? Did, oh, you had no, a it was field. just a screen. It wasn't that, yeah. Oh, there was no soccer being played. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why? Um, I mean, it, you know, that we thought that that was a more appropriate way of using it. We, I mean, we, look, we, haven't, we haven't had much experience in creating kind of sport-led meanwhile spaces. You know, when you're in kind of big urban you know, urban locations, like it's about create, as Roger says, like really special places that create a buzz, create vibrancy and kind of draws people to them. There's, there's companies that do that. Power League right next to us does sport. We just don't do it, that's all. There's loads of people that do sport. Can I just take another question? No, actually, we, swimming is a sport, uh, but we also built a, um, a temporary football pitch, which was floodlit. And it was, what was really interesting about that was creating a, um, a neutral environment which was um, open to everyone but floodlit till late at night and next to a very busy road so there's a lot of natural surveillance meant it was used all the time. It was amazing how much um, people just dropped in and used a football pitch. But it's also a commercial driver to incorporate sport because uh, yeah, there's a younger generation who are just sports mad and we run a lot of running clubs, we um, do a lot of um, pop-up yoga, we do a lot of um, juice bars all that, and there is, I cannot stress the demand for that sort of thing and commercially um, it's adding value to our estate. So we, there's a commercial driver to do pop-up sports activities as well. Great. Um, another question. Gentleman there. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. My name is Ben. I'm an architect. I just wonder how far this whole idea can go um, in terms of the meanwhile use. At the moment, it seems like it's something that, that sits beneath a kind of quite well-established capitalist umbrella uh, beyond which we revert after the meanwhile use to kind of traditional systems of shareholders, etc. And it's the, the, the thing we all know, and it's the system we've worked with for a long time. Um, not meaning to be too radical and, and, and scare everyone, but... Be as radical and scary as how, you want. How far... Can, is this possible to actually, when we hear about the ideas of, of housing people in different ways, you know, going beyond the middle class notions of, you know, you go along and you, you pay a lot of money and have a lovely mojito and a great night out and, and that sort of thing before the developers then come in and build the luxury flats. You know, are there actually the opportunities here for the seeds of a whole new way, a whole new economy, a whole new society, a whole new way of living from which this can actually emerge and, and, and the result of that actually might be that we don't have property developers anymore 
um, and, and there's a whole new system and a whole new way of working. I just I saw the ceiling open. <laughs> so, okay, so there's a crypto-anarchist, Burning man styley fantasy coming out here. Can I just, I, I'll ask you, because I think you, you I'm, we, we, Eric, why, this has been going on for donkey's years. Where are the anarchists? Where are, you know, where are the crypto anarchists? Because by now, someone should have, so should have you know, taken, taken a place over and started to create a new utopia which was completely wild. Like uh, those woods outside Washington where those people live in the trees. Why doesn't that happen? <laughs> Quite often because the, the people who own the tree don't like it. <laughs> um, and that's really the whole, the whole thing, isn't it? It's, it's property value. But actually, just to talk about a little bit about money like that, um, the Spitalfields project, we put 300,000 in, in 92. It was sold for 8 million in 2000. It was sold again for 140 million. And then it's been sold again, and each time it's got smaller. And the residential piece above it was local authority housing. So there was a mechanism. It wasn't perfect, and there, there were all sorts of hiccups. But it is possible. But the underlying problem we're doing exactly as you say. I mean, there are loads of people who would like to. We, we worked um, on the South Bank when we, when, when we did Gable's Wharf. That was a meanwhile project. It's still there, still earning a lot of money. It made enough money to persuade the bank that uh, Coin Street Community Builders were responsible and could be allowed to do the OXO Tower. So it can all work. And the OXO Tower, at least six of the floors are social housing. So yeah, it's possible. But what you have to do is try and get both sides of the risk reward to mediate in the middle. So that's really interesting. So that you, can, you can do it provided there's a balance. Maybe you do, you go wild in one place and you go less wild in the other place? Yeah, I kind of feel like there's, there's potential for greater things maybe if you take it, if you keep pushing on with it. Uh, potentially, if you take these ideas of these kind of, um, you know, these, these kind of n new economies that we're talking about and these new ways of, of, of looking after people and behaving towards each other, that actually there's a a whole different structure that, you know, if it's very successful as a meanwhile use, what stops it being so successful as the use, the normal use? I, I also think it um, depends on who owns the land, right? If, if, if a developer's bought a site, right, clock's ticking, obviously, but if it's owned by the council and there's kind of, you know, less financial pressure to you know build a new development and and the meanwhile space creates real kind of value on on a num from a number of different perspectives and that can be in terms of bringing footfall and vibrancy to the area that can be stimulating local stimulating the local economy um, you know then there, I think there is scope for some of these projects to to stay on and become more permanent for sure hundred percent. <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not in the meanwhile. This mean is quite detailed. You're yeah, shuffling. Sorry, it's so awkward. Say, I know, I've got to say it. You know, <laughs> it. We're not in the meanwhile business because we're just, oh, I want to create this great space, that's oh, it. That's right. Yeah, well, maybe. You know, the, the reality, it's good business. It's like, you know, we've got some of the best guys in the industry at it. We've got, you know, you and I, Richard's got a great track record at Cathedral. I'm not just saying it because he's a nice, smart suit. He's invited us down tonight. We've got Argent, who probably have done probably the best regeneration project I've ever seen in the UK. And you've got people like Tom Bloxham and Urban Splash. It's about timing. When you are taking over a major piece of land, you have to build that demand. You don't just go out in case of Croydon, and build two million square foot straight away, and there really isn't demand. You put a bit of meanwhile on there. You then build out your first phase. Then you build out your second phase. Yeah, but hold on. You're, you're talking about it as an asset class for the landowner. What the gentleman is talking about is, is about it being like an asset class for society. He's basically saying is that people, are ex people want to experiment in, 
creating new ways of working mm. together, you know, or new I, ways I, of generating but, but, money. But, 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 what Vassif is doing is that, providing platforms for people to do those experiments. I mean, you, you, you're, you're, op you're opening box parks within those box parks. People get to run the experiment of providing their yeah. food, opening their shop, like selling their brand. Similarly, we provide housing. That gives people the opportunity, that the people that we house, an opportunity to try things out, live a bit more cheaply. Um, yeah, I think we just need to. All the thing that we need to bear in mind is that lots of the people who are using these meanwhile spaces are doing it because they're in a very difficult financial situation, right? Like it's difficult out there to get a space to start a business. It's difficult to afford a place to to live. I think that as a result of experimenting, people do realize, you know, the sharing economy in general, you know, being more focused on experiences than um, assets. These kinds of things are. I think growing across the whole of society and actually lots of people who are living in houses behind picket fences are a bit jealous of people who can pack up their stuff in a bag, turn up in a new place, make a bed out of some pallets and crack on. And I think we should all like take a little look at what it means to live a little bit more lightly and perhaps focus on those things a bit more. And I hope that we are sowing the seeds of that through, through all the meanwhile work that we're doing, showing that you can actually do stuff with less cash but more energy. Um, and it's true, as exactly as Eric says, that the person who owns the tree doesn't necessarily like people building a tree house in it. And it, it, I am a bit saddened, actually, that I did, wasn't alive to enjoy the kind of 70s squatting era. Like, if you look at the stuff that happened, um, people taking over um, Victorian squares that were, that were empty, and those have now turned into perfectly respectable housing co-ops. Um, you know, the Oxo, the Coin Street community builders being one of them. Um, you know, I think there is scope for us to, to, to show that you can do things differently and more creatively I'm, I'm and more emancipatory. So the, the, me so the, the message is a bit of a conservative, miserable one, I'm afraid, which is basically, nice idea, wrong place. I mean, I, I get it completely as, as a meanwhile say. use in terms of you've got an asset, you've got to get some money out of it. So, I mean, years ago, you'd put car parking on it, but we found kind of better, nicer ways of doing it. I can understand that. But, you know, if the situation is that actually the meanwhile use is creating a much better place and a much better thing than the eventual use, then shouldn't we be looking at that in more detail in terms of other better ways to live in the long term, not just in terms of kind of you know, offsetting any loss before the big thing really happens? Part of the thought, nice idea. Last question, who's it to be? Um, hi, my name's Kat. I work for a think tank called Centre for London. Um, oh, great. So my question is, to what extent um, is, I think, the current appetite for meanwhile use um, about frustration with the limitations of the planning system, especially in terms of impatience or inflexibility? And I think also within that, in terms of the planning system, um, is there such a thing as too much meanwhile use in a specific location? Can we answer one of them? If so, which is the one you really want to hear what they want to say about? <laughs> why, why don't we let the uh, panellists choose? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, who do you want to answer your question then? Since you're, who do you want to hear from? Um, in particular, like Mr. Box Park. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Box Park. I've and so, I'm and Roger. You can call me Mr. Box Park. So Roger and who, <laughs> and who else? One other person. Um, oh, you're the chair. I won't do your job for you. Please. Oh, what a shame! I, I went on. So, so, Mr. So, Box Park. Too much overdose. We're, we're too much of it. I'm not going for the too much overdose. I'm, I'm choosing. <laughs> I'm going for the planning one because it's, it's more. Oh, well, let's not talk about it's based, it. it's based on an interesting example about meanwhile. So, in in our two examples of of getting planning on meanwhile use, we've gone through delegated powers within sort of six weeks, and I think that's a really powerful message in terms of there's a, there's a lot of deliberation about projects and whether they get built. And sometimes it's great, isn't it, just to try something out and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the great benefits about Meanwhile, that you can actually give something a try, you know, and as a result of that, it actually really helps with the planning limitations that are out there. And it certainly helps maybe with the long-term developer, because he's able to say, look, there's already been a Meanwhile sort of temporary retail in my case, and look, there's a demand for it. Let's, let's actually put in planning for long-term. And it's, it's very much a, a, a no-lose bet for the planning department. So there's some definite advantages of having a meanwhile use in terms of the ease of getting planning, and we should encourage it. Just, There'll be more box parts. Yeah. <laughs> so, Reza? Just to add to that, I think plan, I would say it's more political often, right? So, you've got political reasons why boroughs, you know, 
perhaps are going to struggle to pull a site forward for development um, because political issues often take a long time to unravel. And I think that's what's opened an opportunity for a lot of these spaces. And, you know, thankfully, people have now seen the longer term value of them. I'll do the uh, too much meanwhile one. So I would say... Yeah, is there too much? Because it is a bit... We do feel like there is... It does feel a bit peak. I'd say definitely not enough. Bring it on. <laughs> um, I'd say, meanwhile... I hate the expression, meanwhile. What does it mean? My wife says, what the hell does it mean? And then she goes to see the, the things and loves them. You know, how long did they last? Like Eric's projects, you know, Elephant Castle um, Market, the uh, Coin Street example, they've, they've gone on forever. People want authenticity. They don't want to live above Costa. They want... They want interesting quirky stuff in an area and meanwhile is a mechanism for delivering it so let's make it forever while Anna um, I think you have to be careful not to just uh, take a cookie cutter approach as you say it's got to be authentic and linked into the place there has to be a narrative of place and I think if, we, if you haven't got that you have got too much okay so thank you very very much panel um, your cards one idea to make meanwhile worthwhile please complete your thought um thank you very much panel very much i'm sure you'll be around for future conversations and for questions from from the audience and drinks afterwards richard david thank you uh, i just wanted to indulge myself just very briefly i know you want to drink and a couple of things it's not just millennials that uh, maybe enjoy festivals and the anarchy, maybe the authentic anarchy of, of some of those events. I really enjoyed being Mr. Corbyn in the office, in, 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 in the audience. That was great. The thought of longer term activity that really inspires people to take hold. Some sort of huge utopia of hippiness where everyone contributes. Wouldn't that be great? I got a very little story from uh, from a, a festival in the Nevada desert that you need to go to, Reza, you'll enjoy it. Uh, I went with Rich Brett, who's a great designer here, he's, uh, he's from We Like Today, and it was about six or seven in the morning, the time didn't matter, it was in the middle of the desert, there's a pink sky. And uh, so my original company was called Cathedral, and I'm trying, looking for faith. So you can learn a lot from a pop-up or a festival about your own sort of journey and so I'm walking down this desert street and there's this I don't know whether it's full scale because I've never seen a crucifix there's a, there's a bloody great big crucifix and there's this guy on it with a load of uh, sheeting and a, a thing around his head and Rich you might remember this and he's, he's like he's there it's six seven in the morning going man man he said <laughs> we were looking up at him and he said man can you help me and remember this, Rich, he said, we said, yeah, yeah. He said, was the right leg over the left or was the left <laughs> over the right? <laughs> and so, you know, just the energy and the inspiration and the journey is incredible. I'm going to let you go and have a drink. My thanks, our thanks to, to Catherine, to Anna, to Eric, to Reza, Roger, Dan, to you for coming along, for contributing. Great conversation, the naughty uh, and the delightful David Barry uh, chairing so brilliantly. Um, please so show your appreciation um, for the panel. Brilliant. And, uh, and if, if I may, if, if you want to come back, we have thought leadership, you and I think, come back, uh, look at our website, talk to one of the UNI team, come back please and uh, have a drink, have two drinks, have three drinks, enjoy yourself, thank you. <laughs>